Okay, Hanukkah Sameach. Uh, nice to see everybody. Uh, we're going to be talking about the historical background of Hanukkah. People sometimes think that Hanukkah is the latest of all the holidays, uh, after Purim in the Persian period and all the way down in the Greek period. I'd like to argue today the opposite, that Hanukkah is actually the oldest of all of the holidays that we celebrate. Uh, but we're going to need to do some work to get there. Uh, all right, we'll try not to do too many days because this is not a college class, but I do want to get um, have, have some familiarity to uh, get our bearings and where we are. Uh, we um, were, we have the Babylonians, they're the ones that destroyed the first Bet HaMikdash, and we were under their rule for a short time, relatively. Um, and then the Persians came. That's the Purim story happens under the Persians. Life more or less was good under the Persians. They allowed us to uh, practice Judaism as we wanted. Um, except for the occasional Haman, uh, and uh, that, that story you also know. That's about 200 years we're under the Persians. And then we get to Hellenistic rule, um, which uh, starts with Alexander the Great. Um, and it's in the middle of this that we have the, the Hashmonaim, the Hasmonean stories. Later will be the Romans, which will be a very, very long time. But let's start with this with Alexander the Great. Um, he is, uh, um, as you know, Greek, well, he is actually from Macedonia, uh, which is right near Greece, and um, his teacher was, um, was Aristotle, so, you know, it shows you what a, a, good, a good philosophy teacher uh, can, can get you. Um, he, can, he went and he conquered, you know, the entire Middle East. He never lost a war, and so in that sense, he was very successful. And so that is the beginning of the interaction of the Jewish people with the Greek empire and with Hellenism. Hellenism means taking on um, Greek language, Greek culture uh, in different ways. So this first interaction uh, is actually a positive one. And we can tell this from a story that's told to us both in Josephus and in the Tamud Bavli in Masechet Yoma. And this is when Alexander the Great is going and conquering every country after country, just everyone falling by, by, by the side. And he comes to Israel and he meets the Kohen Gadol. Actually, the Kohen Gadol comes out to meet Ale Alexander the Great. And the story is told when he comes out, Alexander the Great sees Kohen Gadol all dressed in his, uh, in his uh, royal, in his garb. And all the other generals are expecting the worst. They say, you know, I'm sure Alexander the Great is going to come and, uh, and maybe do the worst to him. But instead, to everyone's surprise, Jews and non-Jews, Alexander the Great gets off of his horse and actually bows down to the Kohen Gadol and says, I saw you in a dream and you're, you're my inspiration. You, it was your voice that guaranteed that I would have success. An amazing story, and as they um, and uh, and similarly, the the Kohen Gadol says, you know, we are going to be loyal to you, and because of that, uh, the Alexander the Great says that they do not have to pay tax during the Shavuot year, and that um, all the Jews, not only in Israel but everywhere in Babel too, can enjoy their own laws as their uh, as their tradition grants them. And so this was an amazing thing. He even says that if Jews want to come to the army, uh, they can come and we'll take care of them and they can practice their laws even when they're in the army. That's the version, version in Josephus. And the Talmud Bavli has uh, a very similar, a couple of differences, but otherwise a very similar story. And so we see that initially the contact between the Greeks and the Jews was positive, just like under the Persians. Although we didn't have sovereignty, we didn't have independence, we have to pay our taxes to someone, but we have our Beit HaMikdash and we're able to practice Judaism in the way that we wanted to. Okay, good. Um, so that's the beginning of the story. Um, Alexander the Great, uh, it's true, uh, does want to encourage the empire to somehow fit together. So he makes a uniform currency so that people can trade. He also wants to introduce um, uh, some intermarriage. Uh, he himself, uh, marries a Persian princess. He has all his generals marry Persian princesses. And here's one scene, it's called the Weddings of Susa, uh, when he has a mass ceremony in which uh, many of his, uh, of his uh, um, uh, soldiers 
go and marry Persians so that he can integrate socially the Greeks and the Persians that he's conquering. And then he says, I'll give a special wedding gift to anyone who intermarries. So here's a sense where we already see he's encouraging uh, assimilation, but he never required it, right? He would never go to someone and say, you have to marry this person. You cannot marry your own. He never went to any, anyone and said that they, can, they, they cannot practice their traditional uh, religions, whatever it is. So, so far, so good. Now, this, this um, uh, tolerance continued for uh, quite a long time. Alexander the Great, although he was very successful in battle, uh, did get sick on the field and died when he was just 32 years old. Um, so he got to be king of the world, but not for a very long time. I'm not sure if we would take that, uh, that uh, gamble. Um, but so in the end, and this is important because I remember always growing up and hearing about the Syrian Greeks and what are they Greeks or are they Syrians? So let me take a minute to explain this. When he died, uh, there was no successor. He had only a, a baby and a baby can't be king. And so his generals end up fighting about who will be the king of the empire. They fight about it for the next 20, 30 years until they sit down and said, okay, let's split it up into a few parts. And so for us, is what's relevant is Seleucus, that general, he takes uh, the area of Syria and all of this Asia. Um, and Ptolemy, he takes Egypt, which was had Alexandria, which was the capital. So that was very important. Now, where are we? Where is Israel? As usual, right in the middle. We're always in the middle of great empires. You wonder why, uh, why Hashem put Israel in such a place. You know, I don't know if you play Risk, but uh, I know my brother would always take Australia and build up there, right? And nobody would bother him. And then he can come and conquer everybody else. Um, but to be right in the middle, it's always difficult to take Europe because everybody is always attacking you. And uh, so you wonder why Israel is in the spot. It might be on purpose if we're, our goal is to be at Or Lagoim, we're down in Australia, nobody would ever know about us. But being right there in the middle means we have a lot of contact and a lot of influence. Uh, in any case, it's a difficult spot to be in. Uh, because this is on the borderline of these two warring empires. They're both Greek, they're both Hellenistic, but they both want to take over the other one. And so for the first hundred years, from 300 till 200 BCE, we are under the rule of the Egyptian Greeks, the Ptolemies. But then in 201, the king of Seleucus uh, comes and brings his army and pushes uh, down and almost takes over Egypt. Um, and uh, now Israel is under the rule of the Seleucids. During this entire time, not much changes for the Jews. Uh, we have our Kohen Gadol. The Kohen Gadol is not only the religious leader in the Bet HaMikdash, but he's also the political leader. He's going to be the one that will go to the king of the Ptolemies or of the Seleucids and negotiate and, uh, and pay taxes. And so we would answer to him and he answers to the king. But otherwise, the Bet HaMikdash runs smoothly, traditionally, and the Jews can follow their Torah way of life without a problem. So where does the conflict start? Well, for that, we're going to look at the uh, succession of the Kohen Kehuna Gedola. Uh, to become a Kohen Gadol, it doesn't matter how much you donate, you can't be a Kohen Gadol. Um, you could only wait to properly become, become a Kohen Gadol is to be the son of another Kohen Gadol. And so the line of Kihuna Gedola went straight down from Sadok, who was Kohen Gadol in the time of King Shalomo, in the beginning of the first Bet HaMikdash, father to son, all the way down to Shimon HaSadik, uh, a righteous um, a Kohen Gadol, who we know from Perkavot. From him, it goes to his son, Choni, short for Yohanan, uh, you probably heard of Choni HaMe'agel. It's the same name, but a different person. Uh, so Choni, uh, in Greek, is called Onias. And so he was, Onias was Kohen Gadol. He's doing a, a pretty good job. He has some financial problems. There's some people that are upset the way he's, that he's handling the finances of the, of the Bet HaMikdash. It's not an easy job, Kohen Gadol. Not only do you have to know all the laws of Tuman and Tahara and Kodashim and how to serve everything, you also have to be the political leader. You also have to be the CFO. And Bet HaMikdash has a lot of money going through it. So Onias is there and he's doing his job. And one day, here's where the, here's where the story really starts. Onias has a brother named uh, Jason, Hebrew Yehoshua. Uh, Josephus calls him by his Greek name, Jason. 
And uh, Jason says, uh, you know, I would really like to be Kohen, Kohen Gadol. And uh, now my older brother is, you know, so I could wait, maybe he dies or something. But uh, Jason says, you know what I'm gonna do? I have an idea. How do you become Kohen Gadol practically? Well, he goes to Antiochus. Antiochus is the Greek king, the king of the Seleucid Empire. He's in charge of everything. And Jason goes one day and says, hey, Antiochus, really, I would like to be Kohen Gadol. I'm the brother, I'm the right line. And here's a bribe. So he bribes his way and buys the Kehuna Gedola. This is not the right way to do things, but he's still legitimate in the sense that he's from the right family. And uh, he has backing him uh, some people that want more Hellenism in, uh, in, in, the, in Jerusalem. Um, one of them is the Tobias family. I don't know if there's any Tobiases here. Oh, David Tobias, yeah. Okay, not, nothing personal, it's not about you. I don't know if you're related to this Tobias family, but way back then, uh, this was a rich family and they wanted to have uh, more trade with other uh, cities in the empire. They were enamored by uh, Greek culture and entertainment and language. They were also traditional Jews um, in the sense they wouldn't intermarry or anything like that, um, but they wanted there to be more. And so they sponsored, they backed Jason in this quest. And now Jason comes, he's Kohen Gadol and he says, listen, we're gonna have some new policies here we're going to apply to make Jerusalem into a capital city, a special Hellenistic city called a polis. And as that has special uh, tax benefits and uh, trade benefits, that also means we get to build a gymnasium. A gymnasium is not just a, a place that you pay uh, $500 a month and never go to to work out. Uh, back then the gymnasium was a place where you send your kids for education, for Greek education, they would learn Greek language and, um, and poetry uh, and entertainment, and they would play sports without clothes on, and a, a, a glorification of uh, the physical body. And so they felt that that's the kind of education that they want for their kids. Uh, maybe they learned some Torah also on the side, um, but you see that already some a new, new spirit is entering Jerusalem. Now, nothing quite changed yet in the Bet HaMikdash. Bet HaMikdash is continuing as, as usual. And if you happen to be a traditional Jew and you don't want to send your kid to, to the gymnasium, no one's forcing you to do so. And you can send your kid to, to the yeshiva as regular. But you might be watching this and kind of be upset at these, this new spirit that is entering Jerusalem. So Jason comes up, he's a moderate Hellenizer. Um, uh, and uh, so this is where it starts. But now it gets very serious with Menelaus. And Menelaus, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's the real villain of the story. You notice I didn't, I didn't mention Antiochus yet, okay? Antiochus is far away. At this point, he's down in Egypt. He's trying, he has a war with the Ptolemies that he's trying to win. He's not thinking about the Jews or anybody else. Um, Menelaus comes, he is not, he's a friend of Jason, not related. Uh, maybe he's a Kohen, he might not even be a Kohen. He's, he's, he's just a guy who's Jason's friend. Now, Jason, you can't just bribe Antiochus once. You gotta keep bribing him a, a bunch of times uh, every year. And so Jason can't go one time. So he tells his friend Menelaus here, take this money, would you mind? And go to Antiochus and just you know make sure he's continuing to back me as Kohen Gadol. So Menelaus as a good friend would do on the way says, hmm, I have an idea. Why don't I just add some more money to this and I could be Kohen Gadol. Why not? Who is stopping me? And that's exactly what he does. He goes and Antiochus says, what does Antiochus care, right? Who's Kohen Gadol, whoever pays him the most. So he says, okay, fine. You're Kohen Gadol Menelaus. And now Menelaus, um, you know, Jason started this, but Menelaus continued, continues it to a uh, ridiculous and very harmful end. He is an extreme Hellenizer. He, he doesn't want the Jews to have a distinctive way of life. It's like, why do we have to be different from everybody else? Uh, why do, why, how come in our, in our temple, we don't have idols like everyone, everyone else does? Um, after all, you know, we believe in one God and the Greeks all, well, they believe in a lot of gods, but one highest one, Zeus, right? And so, you know, why don't we just say that's all, all the same thing? And Menelaus turns the Bet HaMikdash into a temple for Zeus. 
and he doesn't want people um, being circumcised. Let's see, he says, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the Greeks didn't like that because the body should be perfect. And how can you, how can you do that? So he starts outlawing Berit uh, Mila. Menelaus is really the evil villain of this whole story. And now you can imagine if you're a simple traditional Jew, you just want to practice the way of life that your grandparents and great grandparents did. You just want to follow the Torah. And now you can't go to the Bet HaMikdash anymore. It's all defiled. And so uh, many people uh, start fighting Menelaus um, in, this, in the walls of, of Jerusalem, inside the city, there's hand-to-hand -hand combat, physical violence. This turns into an all out civil war. One among many groups who are fighting Menelaus are the Chashmonaim, the family of the Maccabees, headed by Matityahu. Okay, so this is the beginning of the story. This actually starts off as, as a civil war between Hellenizing Jews and, um, and uh, traditional Jews. Uh, is the, how do we know this? Um, well, uh, our main source is the book of Maccabees, the books of Maccabees. And here's one paragraph that says, in those days, there appeared in Israel men who were breakers of the law, it's Jews who were breakers of the law. And they seduced many people saying, let us go and make an alliance with the Gentiles all around us. Since we have separated from them, many evils have come upon us. So you see that Hanukkah is actually quite different from Purim. Uh, Purim, we're minding our own business, or or uh, or Pesach for that matter. You know, we're in Egypt. We're minding our own business. We're doing our thing, and then all of a sudden, Paro Haman comes and says, "Who are these people who are different? Why are they here? We have to be afraid of them. Let's wipe them out." And so it's an attack from uh, an evil, anti-Semitic, uh, intolerant uh, outsider ruler that is coming upon us. Hanukkah starts off in a very different way. It starts off internally um, of Jew against Jew, um, some being attracted to the, to the polish of the culture that they see around them, and others who want to stay true to their traditions, to the Torah. And so here's another paragraph that shows the, the beginning, the first violent act uh, that, uh, that sparks this civil war. There was a certain Jew who came in the sight of all to sacrifice to the idols upon the altar in the city of Modi'in, according to the king's command. So already the king is involved here. I'll, I'll tell you in a minute how he gets involved. Matityahu saw and was grieved and his reins trembled and his wrath kindled according to the judgment of the law of the Torah and running upon him, he slew him. Matityahu kills this Jew upon the altar. We're not told in the story if this Jew was forced to do this uh, idolatrous worship or he did it willingly. Either way, um, he running up, he slew upon the altar. Moreover, the man whom the king Antiochus had sent, who compelled them to sacrifice, he slew at the same time, pulled down the altar, and he acted like Pinchas. Okay, good. So you see Matityahu's first act is actually to kill a Jew who is violating, who is doing idolatry. Now, where does Antiochus come in? Okay, so that is the next chapter of the story. If you want to know what Antiochus looks like, this is a coin uh, that was minted during his time. So now we actually know what he looked like. Um, amazing to be able to recover that. Okay, so here's our, our little timeline to review. In 332, Alexander the Great conquers Israel, and uh, then it goes into a period of, uh, of, um, of unrest, and we're under Ptolemaic rule, and then under Seleucid rule, and here's where the story begins. Um, Jason in 175 becomes Kohen Gadol, and then 171, Menelaus becomes Kohen Gadol, converts the temple into a pagan shrine. Um, now Antiochus uh, enters the picture. Antiochus at this time was down in Egypt. He's, a, he, he's about to take over the, uh, the Ptolemaic Empire, and had, that will have a huge single uh, Hellenistic Empire. So he's very excited about that. The problem is, as he's at the gates of Alexandria, uh, the Romans uh, say, we don't want to have this. The Romans are already very important, very, very strong, and they see what's happening. They eventually are going to conquer all of the East, and they'd rather have two smaller empires than one big one to contend with. And so they send a messenger to Antiochus and say, Antiochus, go home. We don't want you conquering Egypt. 
and uh, and they draw a circle. The messenger draws a circle around Atiochus, and Atiochus says, "I'll think about it." it says, Yo, "You'll think about it here, right now, right or else." And so Rome was powerful enough that Antiochus did not uh, conquer Egypt, and he went back home sulking. Now on his way home, right, he's going to Egypt all the way back up to Syria, he passes through Eretz Yisrael. And as he's passing through, he hears a rumor that the Jews are rebelling against him. Is that true? Well, it's not exactly, the Jews are not, have nothing against Antiochus in particular, but the traditional Jews are in fact fighting against Antiochus, who is his appointee. So if uh, someone goes against the person that Antiochus appointed, then indirectly, they are in fact rebelling against Antiochus. And so Antiochus can't have this uh, unrest in, the, in his empire. And so on his way home, he goes to Jerusalem. By the way, remember that he, uh, uh, he's strapped for cash, right? Fighting a war is very expensive. It's good if it pays off. If you, if you win the war, then you could take everything. Um, but now he lost, the, he lost the war. He was not able to conquer Alexandria. And so he comes in and he sees what's going on. And so first of all, he um, loots the Bet HaMikdash. Bet HaMikdash held a lot of money, their own, other people's. And so this made a lot of people very, very upset, obviously. And now he has to take sides in this civil war. Um, and so who is he going to choose? Well, obviously, he's going to choose the side of Menelaus. That's the person he appointed. Also, all matters being equal, he'd prefer more Hellenism than less Hellenism, right? Um, so he sides with Antiochus, and that's when things really heat up because now whatever uh, smaller things that Menelaus said that you can't do this and that, Antiochus backs them up and makes total persecution and says you're not allowed to learn Torah, you're not allowed to eat kosher, all these things are prohibited. And now this turns out into an all out, not just a civil war, but actually a total war of traditional Jews against um, the, the Hellenizing, Hellenized Jews and the entire Antiochus's entire army. And I don't know if you could picture yourself in such a situation and uh, you see how difficult it would be for a small, small group of traditional Jews to think that they can possibly win against the, this giant army of fellow Jews there also is, is truly the bin biyad me'atim. But luckily we had um, a uh, courageous warriors in Matijau and his sons, Yehuda Maccabi and Yehuda's, uh, Yehuda's brothers. And they were able uh, through guerrilla warfare, hiding out, coming out and attacking, uh, and, then, and then going back, they were able miraculously to have, uh, to have success and drive away the, um, the uh, Hellenistic forces. They didn't conquer them all together, right? They didn't take over the entire uh, uh, Greek empire, obviously, um, but they managed to push them away enough that they had control over the Bet HaMikdash. They were able to gain control over Jerusalem. And eventually over the next uh, decades, they were able to expand their control to the entire land of Israel. That took a while um, and completely have independence, completely have sovereignty and not be answerable to the Greeks at all. Okay, um, a little bit more about Antiochus. Um, and so, you know, this is a, a more complex version of the story than uh, perhaps we learned in kindergarten, but I think that makes sense. Kindergarten, it's, it's uh, good guys and bad guys. It's uh, simply that. Um, but we see here that Hanukkah has a, a, a distinctive quality to it. Um, and so if we ask, like, what happened to Antiochus? Just an evil man who decided to persecute the Jews? Not quite. He never went to any other minorities um, in his empire and said, you can't follow your uh, traditional practice. That, that's not what he's about. He was a great Hellenizer. He wanted more unity. And so he would support people that did, but did not force it upon anyone. Uh, he was like a little crazy, uh, nervous, eccentric. They say that Antiochus, sometimes he would dress up as a pauper and uh, he would go and crash people's parties. And he would bring a, a, a big uh, vat of soap with him and pour soap all over the floor and watch everybody as they slipped on the soap. That's what he did for fun. So he's a bit of a nut, uh, but not particularly, not particularly anti-Semitic. Um, so rather, um, the way when we really look at the sources carefully, the Book of Maccabees especially, 
we see that it was actually started by the Jewish Hellenizers. The real villain is first Jason and then Menelaus. It's the Jewish Hellenizers that prompted the decrees against uh, following the Torah. And it was actually a result of the civil war, not the cause of the war. Um, okay, so this is this is a very this is very important for understanding what Hanukkah is all about, and uh, you know, in some ways, it makes it um, relevant in a different way. And I wonder today if uh, you know what is our what is our greatest threat? Is it from inside or from outside? Um, you know, we were thankful to have so many friends all over the world, um, but uh, we also have Iran that's a growing nuclear threat. And so certainly that would be more like a Purim story. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Hanukkah has special relevance to us because we're living in America, wherever we're living, and we're constantly struggling with uh, the culture around us by the draw that, uh, that has on us intellectually, materialistically, fashion, all, always. And uh, it's really that, that conflict that um, we're constantly working through and Hanukkah tells us a special story about that, or a warning as well. Okay, I'm gonna say more about that in a few minutes, um, but I'd like to speak about the, the holiday itself. Um, so we talked about why Antiochus persecuted the Jews, but how did Hanukkah come to be what it is? Why do we celebrate for eight days? And why now? Why on the 25th of Kislev? What's the significance of these days? And uh, through that, I think we can answer what Hanukkah means for us today. All right, so why on the 25th of Kislev? Uh, the wrong answer is because of the name Hanukkah. Some people say it means Hanu Bekafe. They rededicated the Bet, the Bet Mikdash on Kafe on the 25th of the month. Um, that's a cute derasha, but really the word Hanukkah simply means rededication. Um, and wouldn't tell you the month anyway. Uh, so uh, another simple answer is simply because that's the day they won the war. They won the war and they immediately came and rushed into the Bet HaMikdash. I think of, uh, you know, on the, uh, the second day of the Six Day War, uh, when they're able to rush into the, uh, in, uh, onto the, into the Kotel and they're singing and dancing, that they are able to um, uh, redeem the uh, old city of, uh, of Jerusalem. Um, so you kind of picture that, they're rushing into the Bet HaMikdash and they, uh, they find the vial of oil. But when we look at the sources carefully, we see that actually the process was more gradual. And the 25th of Kislev, in this sense, actually has more significance than we thought. So here's some of my proofs. Uh, there's another work that's very important for history. It's called Megillat Ta'anit. This is written by the sages, maybe one of the earliest works of the sages, a list of 36 dates that are happy days for the Jews, and you're not allowed to fast on these days. I'll go through them quickly. One of them is the 23rd of Cheshvan. So in other words, a full month before, uh, they, the, uh, the Maccabees came and they were able to remove the lattice work in the Bet HaMikdash. Turns out that the Hellenizers introduced a place of Zonot in the Bet HaMikdash. Um, that was part of their pagan worship. And so the Maccabees came and cleaned that out, destroyed it. And they made that a Yom Tov. Then on the third of Kislev, right, just uh, 10 days later, uh, they uh, took out the idols from the Bet HaMikdash, the idols all over the place. What we see from here is that actually the Maccabees gained control of the Bet HaMikdash for at least a month before the 25th of Kislev. And they couldn't clean it out in one day. There was so much pollution that gathered up there. It took them several weeks uh, to get the Bet HaMikdash ready for its rededication. And so therefore we see that the 25th of Kislev is something, a day that they actually planned, right? It was around that time, but technically they probably could have been ready a few days before, a few days later. What's special about the 25th day of Kislev that they chose? Here's one hint. Um, in the book of Haggai, he's one of the last of the Nevi'im. When they built, when they first built the second Bet HaMikdash, um, they dedicated its foundations on what day? Haggai tells us it was on the 24th of the ninth month. That's the 24th of Kislev. And so you can imagine if that's when they finished the foundations, then the next day might have been a day of celebration. In other words, the 25th day of Kislev was already a very important day 
a kind of a kind of a Chanukah in which they had dedicated the second Bet Hamikdash when it was first built. Okay, keep that in mind. And now we see here, um, the Book of Maccabees tells us that when the Hellenizers took control, when Menelaus came and took control of the Bet Hamikdash, um, it was on the fifteenth day of Kislev that they erected a an altar, a mizbeach. For, that would be for idolatry. That's when they built it, on the 15th day. The end of that paragraph says they waited until the 25th day of the month before sacrificing on it. And this is really strange. If these Hellenizers, right, these evil people, they built a Bezbeach on the 15th, why didn't they use it the same day? It seems that they waited until the 25th. So in other words, the 25th was day of, of Kislev was already a significant day way before the Maccabees came, it, a couple of years before, and they picked it because it was already an important day even beforehand. Um, so, uh, so far the steps we have are the Bet HaMikdash was first dedicated on the 25th of Kislev, then the Hellenizing Jews chose that day to desecrate the Bet HaMikdash, and that's why the Maccabees waited until that day specifically to rededicate it in holiness on the 25th of Kislev. And there's one more resonance, and this takes us not only back to the year 518, but actually all the way back to the year zero. Uh, very important midrash, I'll read it in English. It's in Masechet Abu Dazara. When Adam was created, assuming he was created around Tishrei in the fall, uh, so he was around, he was created around the day that the day and night were about the same length. But then as time went on, right, then fall turns into winter, he saw the day getting shorter and shorter. And he says, woe is me, it's because I have sinned. That's why the world is becoming darkened and it's going to go back into tohu vabohu. This is the punishment that Hashem has decreed upon me because of my sin. It's going to be total darkness. So you see Adam, he's a good scientist. He sees where this is going, every day getting a few minutes shorter. So he decided to make an, a, a fast day, an eight day fast day, um, right around this time. And then he saw the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year passed. Um, and now the day started getting longer and longer. And he says, oh, now I understand there's different seasons. Days get shorter, then they get longer, then they get shorter again. And so he was so happy that he made this a, um, a holiday. And the next year, he appointed both his festivals. And so he made an annual holiday to celebrate the day when the winter solstice turns from the shortest day of the year as the days get longer and longer. Here's the key line. He, Adam, fixed them for the sake of heaven, l'shem shamayim. But the other people in the world, the non-Jews, appointed them for the sake of idolatry. All right, so now all this is reflecting that in the future, um, there's going to be a group of pagans uh, and uh, during Roman times, during Christian times, right? You might have heard of a holiday around this time uh, that's, uh, that other religions uh, follow. And so what the point is here that everybody in the world looks up at and looks up and notices that the days go from the shortest day and become a little longer. So cultures around the world did something to celebrate this day. We have, we find in Africa, ancient temples where on this day, the sunlight goes into a certain spot and, uh, and lights up. See, everybody's happy about this. The significant thing is that Adam made this holiday to be L'shem Shamaim to thank Hashem for it, was, whereas others used it for idolatry. Now, when is this holiday? This is the origin of Hanukkah because the winter solstice is around the 25th. Um, there is another holiday on the 25th of December, uh, which following the solar calendar, the winter solstice is more like the 22nd or 23rd, but I think uh, without precise measurements, you'll take a couple of days to notice that the days start getting longer. Uh, we, we're following a, a loony solar calendar, and so for us, it's the 25th of Kislev. But here's the point, Hanukkah is actually the oldest holiday on, in, in human history, and certainly for the Jews. However, originally it was celebrated as a pagan holiday, and that is in fact why the Hellenizers, when they came, they said, let's pick the 25th day of Kislev 
to make the uh, to dese to desacralize to desecrate the Beit Hamikdash, and that is the day that the Maccabees chose. And this is really interesting and gets that at the heart of what Chanukah is all about. You might have thought that maybe the Maccabees would come and say, "Let's pick any day but that day. That's the day on which you know that such terrible things happen to us." Uh, but instead, they said, "No, let's kedushify that day." Uh, to borrow uh, to borrow by Lavatan's word, right? We'll take something that was used for paganism, that was used for evil, and we will take it, incorporate it, purify it, and turn this into a great festival, into something that is like what Adam did, make it something that is the Shem Shamayim. And this is a very effective way to go about things because if people are already celebrating something on this day, um, then better to take their excitement about it and move it into the right direction. Um, and now we have this wonderful holiday in which, well, it's a holiday of lights, isn't it, right? And we go from one light and we increase every day, which is exactly what nature is doing. Um, and it has uh, also a great symbolic significance in that a time of great darkness and which we thought we were going to be destroyed by the enemy and by our own internal enemies. And all of a sudden from nowhere, unexpectedly, we see a light a shining forth and growing and that represents the great miracles of Hanukkah and uh, the great providence that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has for us in every generation. All right, if you have a little more patience, I'd like to add one more point, which is, why is Hanukkah eight days? What's so special about eight days? Um, and so uh, this is uh, a question that Rabbi Yosef Kado asked, um, and he offers three answers. And then later on in the 1960s, uh, a rabbi wrote a book uh, called Ned Lema'an, in which he gives a hundred answers to this question. Um, but I'll just go through a couple of them and I'll tell you what I think is the historical answer. So what's, what's, the, uh, what's at the heart of this eight days? Well, if we look at Josephus, um, he sheds no light on this matter. Uh, he says that we call it the holiday of lights. I suppose the reason was because this liberty was beyond our hopes, appeared to us, and that thence it was given the name of that festival. So actually Josephus doesn't even call it Hanukkah, he calls it the holiday of lights. Um, until today in Israel, you'll find a lot of people calling it Chag Ha'urim, the holiday of lights, and that's um, probably based on Josephus. So um, Josephus knows that we celebrate with light, but he doesn't tell us anything about uh, it being eight days, so that's no help. Instead, um, we can uh, look at the famous Midrash here that's in Masechet Shabbat, is also found in Megillah Tanit. This is my Chanukah. What is Chanukah all about? Um, on the 25th, I'll read in English here for you. Um, on the 25th of Kislev, uh, the day of Chanukah, which are eight, where, on which lamentations and fasting are forbidden. You see, that's the language of Megillah Tanit, happy days, no fasting. Because when the Greeks entered the temple, they, defi they defiled all of the oils therein. And when the Chashmonaim prevailed against and defeated them, they made a search and found only one cruise of oil, which lay with the seal of the Kohen Gadol, but which contained sufficient only for one day, yet a miracle was wrought and they lit for eight days. And the following year, they appointed a festival with the recitation of Hallel and Thanksgiving. Okay, good. So they found enough for one day, which means that the miracle happened for seven days. So once again, we ask, why do we celebrate for eight days and not only seven? All right, there are many answers to this, but um, if you just say, you know, it just happened to be, well, what's the significance of eight? Uh, okay, anyone who studied with Rabbi Shama or Rabbi Sassoon knows that the number eight has special significance. Actually, if you just read the Torah, uh, right, we see the number eight, is always an uh, indication of the, of the Berit, the Berit Milah is on the eighth day. Uh, so hold on to that. Um, I'm going to skip this reason. The Book of Maccabees says they celebrated eight days just like King Shalomo uh, made an eight day feast when he dedicated the first Bet Mikdash. That's an interesting answer, except it's not true. He celebrated for seven and seven days and sent everybody home on the eighth day. So this doesn't really work. Here is, I think, what is the historical answer? This is mentioned in that book of 100 Answers um, as, as one of them. And this comes from the second book of Maccabees, chapter 10. It tells us as follows that, that Maccabeus, that's Yudah Maccabee, um, when they came and recovered the city and they tore down the altars 
and they uh, cleaned everything up. After two years, they offered incense and they lit the lamps and they set out the lechem apanim and they prayed to Hashem that they should, uh, if they ever sinned in the future, Hashem should not give such a terrible punishment. And it happened, this is important, on the same day on which the sanctuary had been profaned by the foreigners, the purification of the sanctuary took place on the 25th of Kislev. So you see, regarding our previous discussion, they, they chose this day on purpose. They wanted to make a day of you know, a bad day into a happy day, kind of like uh, Yom HaShoah, the day that was chosen for Yom HaShoah as the day of the uprising in the um, uh, in of, of the of the ghetto, um, and uh, so you know a day that they lost uh, a day of destruction. Then um, uh, Israel chose as the day to commemorate uh, Yom HaShoah. Um, okay, um, so a similar way. But back to eight days, uh, they celebrated it for eight days with rejoicing. Why? In the matter, matter, just like they celebrated Sukkot. They remembered how not long before that very year, they were not able to celebrate Sukkot because they were living, hiding out in the mountains and the caves like wild animals. And so now, finally, although it's a couple of months late, when they rededicate the Bet HaMikdash, they say, we want to celebrate and we miss celebrating Sukkot. So you say, say, let's do Sukkot in the winter. And so they go out and they get lulavim and uh, right, ivy wreathed wands and branches and they celebrate with Thanksgiving. In other words, they say Hallel. Um, and they do this for eight days. Why eight days? Well, Sukkot and Shemini Aseret is an eight day holiday. And that's why they celebrate Sukkot for eight days. That's why they celebrate Chanukah for eight days. In other words, Chanukah is modeled after Sukkot. Uh, this is very important because even halacha now, uh, we say full halal every day. Um, it's the uh, only holiday we do that besides Sukkot. On Pesach, we don't. Pesach, we say full halal only the first day, not the rest of the days. And so you see that um, this uh, that uh, Sukkot has an entire integral connection. It's the basis for Hanukkah. Um, both of them, Sukkot is, you know, the number one holiday when people would come and, and celebrate in the Bet HaMikdash. And so it's a very appropriate to celebrate a rede rededication with Sukkot. Okay, I'll give a proof to this. Um, I had the Book of Maccabees, but there is a hint to this also in the Talmud. Um, and this is encoded in the opinion of Bet Shammai. I mentioned Bet Hillel, that's what we do. We go from one to eight and we say, Ma'alim Bakodesh and Moridin. It's appropriate the winter solstice to start with a little bit of light and go into more. But how about going from eight to one? What's the sense in that? Isn't that kind of uh, diminishing? So Bet Shammai says, it will correspond to the bulls of the festival, meaning of Sukkot. On Sukkot, we give a different number of uh, bulls each day. On the first day, 13, and then 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. We go down every day of Sukkot. And so Bet Shammai says, oh, look at that. Just like we give a descending number of animals on Sukkot, so too on, on Hanukkah, we should descend from eight to one. And everybody reading this is like, what's the connection, right? You sound found some place somewhere in the Torah where we go, where we count down. What's the, what's the point? What's the connection between Hanukkah and Sukkot? And I think now we have the answer. Bet Shammai was holding on to this ancient idea that Hanukkah is actually based on, uh, is actually based on Sukkot. So I'll, um, wrap up with, uh, with the theme of Kedushifying. Um, I think that is the theme. Uh, on, the one, on the one hand, we had these Hellenizers, Jason and Menelaus, who uh, didn't care very much for Judaism, for their traditions, for their identity, and they just wanted to blend in, assimilate with everybody else. And this was a terrible danger. The answer of the Maccabees is not only to purify and do things the right way, but also um, to be proud and strong of who we are. And part of the way we do that is by taking things from outside of us and incorporating them and kedushifying them. Um, and rather than put up walls and say, you know, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to learn anything, um, a, a more productive way and actually a way of enhancing, enriching Judaism. After all, we do want to be an or lagoyim, uh, we see that it's actually Hanukkah is the most successful holiday in that sense. Every other holiday, Pesach, we're in our homes, we're teaching our children. 
but Chanukah, we're putting on display in our windows for everyone to see in public parks, in the White House, right? Everywhere, uh, every, around the world on television, people are seeing the glow of, the, of, of Chanukah. And so precisely because we have that, that connection, we are able to do that. And so the Maccabees say, we're going to keep our, our pride in our tradition. And through that, we can be an Ola Goyim and enhance those around us. And in turn, we can take in and kedushify uh, those, uh, those things that are around us. We see that most prominently in taking this winter solstice pagan holiday and that being the basis of Chanukah, we bring Sukkot, we combine it with this ancient holiday of the winter solstice, and they together you create something that is absolutely is a new holiday, but in a deep sense is actually the oldest holiday that is on the books. And the celebration of light becomes not just something uh, that celebrate nature that we see more light each day, but rather a symbol of uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu's providence. And I'll end with that point and uh, hope and pray that Hashem continue to protect us and to keep us strong and that we in turn continue to have great pride in our traditions and uh, thereby have wonderful celebrations of Chanukah for many, many years to come uh, uh, with great success to uh, Jewish people uh, here and especially in Eretz Yisrael. So Chanukah Sameach, thank you. Thank you all. For- <laughs>